It's good to have information available, but it has to be ingested at the right time and at the right pace. The process of assimilating the knowledge into the performance is a process of rationalizing. And so if a teacher has struggled in their past, then they are much more sympathetic to the students who are struggling with the same problems. When we start to tackle the barriers, as a teacher, I haven't developed the relationship with the student and the student hasn't developed the relationship with you as a teacher, that's never going to work. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Tokushikai Insight Look podcast, where we explore the insights and experiences of martial artists from all walks of life. Today we're speaking with Peter West Sensei from Cornwall, England. West Sensei is one of the most senior Iaido instructors in the United Kingdom and holds the rank of Kyoshi 7th Dan Iaido and 4th Dan Jodo. He is the head instructor of the Myoken Dojo and has been teaching weekly classes on Zoom since the pandemic started with participants from all over the world. Today we'll be talking about barriers to progress, a topic he's written about specifically for challenging 4th and 6th Dan Iaido in the Kendo Federation. While this discussion is based in Iaido, the concepts and lessons introduced are widely applicable to all walks of life. Please enjoy this mentally stimulating conversation with Peter West Sensei. Thank you so much for taking this interview. I think a lot of people, especially in the martial arts, are shy to share their opinions. Oh, um, I can understand that. Definitely. I am as well. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to drag it out of me. But that's what I see because we all know that we, we go to a taikai, we go to an embu, and then the, like, the minute after we finish, we're like, I could do better than that. And I think that's the same thing. We can't say that something I said even five minutes ago is the person who I am now because I might have learned something even in the act of speaking it out. So oh, absolutely. But I think also there's an aspect of learning which a lot of people either don't understand or I'm just deluding myself. But I think that we have a lot more in our head than we've put into our body. We watch our teacher, we listen to our teacher, we think about what we're doing. And our mind knows a lot more things than we have yet put into our body. And I think this leads to the phenomenon where a lot of people say, oh, I'm not ready to take a grading yet because they haven't put into their body all of the things that in their head they know they should be doing. But once those things filter into their body, there will be more things in their head. They will never feel ready. And so they have to trust their teacher and their teacher says, you are ready now to do it. They have to learn to trust that guidance. And that applies in all of our performance. I think if you enter a Taikai, for example, I think Taikai is the example you gave. If you enter a Taikai and you come out thinking you did your best, then that's a really sad situation because it means there's nothing in your head that you are not yet putting into your body. So what are you going to practice? Mm -hmm. It seems like it's relevant when you have someone that's trying to progress, trying to get to the next level, trying to win the next Taikai, they, they can have two ways. They could succeed and then not know why they succeeded, or they could fail and not know why they failed. Mm. So. Yeah, I'll dive straight in with that then, because yes, what I wanted to, to talk about was I perceive learning as having two basic categories of problems. I call them hurdles and barriers. And so let's look at hurdles first, because it's the simplest one to understand. This is just my personal definition. The hurdles are aspects of the art which have to be learned. They are, in Iaido, for example, how to hold a sword, how to stand in Chudan, how to step forward and cut. And then what does a kata comprise of? How do I do this first kata? What are the points? Where is the enemy? How do I have to move? They are the things which are intrinsic to the kata itself. And... This is just a process of teacher teaches the student, the student does what he's told, and eventually he gets it. And that involves the Chakugan 10 as well, the points for gradings and competitions. I think there are 44 of them listed in the Zen Kenren book. And of course, there's the descriptions of the kata as well. So once you can do everything that's in the book, you should be able to pass third dan. And that takes about four years. It shouldn't take more than four years to learn what's in the book. It doesn't mean that we don't revisit it and check it and make sure we haven't forgotten it or misunderstood it. But those basic points shouldn't take very long. 
and students will have difficulties with different aspects of learning that process. So some people will have a better coordination, another student may have a better memory. I've had students who've had terrible coordination problems and have taken years just to be able to step forward and cut comfortably in a relaxed kind of way. And you've probably seen when you have a new student in the dojo, they can walk across the dojo and they can lift their hands over their head, but you tell them to walk and lift their hands over their head and they look like a robot. It's very difficult to learn the flow of a new series of actions. And this, to me, is all in the section that I call hurdles. The second section, the barriers, are the ones that I think the student brings themselves into the training. These are the things that are not intrinsic to the kata, but they are about personality, about character, about previous learning, about attitude, and so on. And these things are much more difficult to break. And so if a, a student, for example, has watched a lot of YouTube kata before they come to the dojo and they have a, a strong uh, confirmation bias, they will believe that what they've understood from what they've seen in the video is right. And that's very difficult for a, a dojo leader to break down, to instill in the student a confidence and faith, and it has to be a faith that what the teacher is teaching is correct. You have to take it on trust. If you don't take it on trust, then you're not going to make any progress because those barriers will always be in your way, irrespective of whether you can overcome the hurdles of learning the movements. You'll never do them well because personal barriers are preventing that. So it sounds like you're saying the hurdles are things that the student doesn't have that they need to ingest while barriers are things that soon brings and they have to get rid of yeah yeah they bring it into the dojo with them when when they arrive yeah. mm -hmm. i i think the interesting thing about this is that it relates to the relationship between the student and the teacher i, mm -hmm. I don't think hurdles are difficult to understand I'm, I'm not saying that they're easy to surpass but they're not difficult to understand and i think barriers are not difficult to understand from the outsider. You know, when you're tackling your own barriers, it's very difficult. But when somebody else is watching you, they're very easy to understand. But the relationship between the student and the teacher develops. So if you have a new student arriving at the dojo, you don't know what their barriers are. And you have to find out what those barriers are and you have to help them confront them and help them to recognize them and understand them. Whereas the hurdles are very easy to understand. The hurdles are, uh, they're listed in a book, you know, and there is a book with them all printed out. There's like 50 or 60 pages of descriptions and these things you have to do right. And that's, that's not difficult to understand. And I think that overcoming the hurdles, learning the techniques and helping the student to achieve a fluency with those techniques is the entry level. That's, that's where the teacher and the student develop a relationship. I think that with, with Ido, there is kind of entry level and there is more advanced. And, and for me, Seite EI is the kind of filter. Seite EI is the EIDO for everyone. Of course, it was originally intended to give people who do Kendo an opportunity to work with a real sword. That was its expressed original intention. It seems to have failed in that intention in a large part because there are still many, many people who do kendo who don't do iido. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, there are a lot of people who do karate, who do sword work. The, the point is, Seite EI, because of the way it's been designed and because of the way it's been documented, and because the key points of how the kata should be performed are written down in a way that, to a large extent, are not debatable, then it's very easy for a teacher to develop a relationship with the students and say, now you've got to learn this, now you've got to learn this. Look what it says in the book, you've got to do it this way. And that, as I say, will get them to about third down, maybe even fourth down if they have a, a natural ability. But there comes a point where you can't take that any further there comes a point where you have to start looking at the character of the person and how that person relates to their Budo development rather than their Iaido learning. 
And that is the point at which the relationship between the teacher and the student has to change. In the dojo, of course, you see your students every week or every day or a couple of times every week. And you can assess the, that development and you can assess how they're changing. You can assess how they're understanding. And you can start to introduce uh, koryu kata in a very simple way, almost as if they were another set of seite ei. Basically, you do it like this, you do this, you do this, you do this. Don't ask any questions. There's no book. Uh, there's nothing you can refer to, just do what I'm telling you, and that's the kata. And you can do that to a certain extent at national seminars and so on. But you have to accept at national seminars, a lot of the students are not your own personal students. They are students of other people. And so once you start introducing Koryu into national seminars, you start treading on people's toes and it becomes political and it becomes very awkward. And so we have to be very careful how we do that. And this is why national seminars using SETE EI are, are perfect. So you have a seminar, you have a grading, the grading is all SETE, the training is all SETE, everybody's happy, you don't teach anything wonderful, you just go through the book again. And even if the people are taking fifth down or sixth down, you just go through the book again and say, look, did you read the book? You're not doing what it says. It's simple. You haven't, you haven't jumped all the hurdles. But if you want to go beyond SETA and if you want to go into Koryu properly, then the hurdles should already have been jumped. The students should already know how to move and how to do all of the basic fundamental things. But to take the training deeper into Budo, to understand the relationship between what you're learning and why you're learning it and what it's doing for you as a person, this is when you start to tackle the barriers. And if you, as a teacher, haven't developed the relationship with the student and the student hasn't developed the relationship with you as a teacher, that's never going to work. So I have people come to me and say, I don't have a direct teacher because I learned through visiting various dojos and I don't have a, a strong lineage, but I want to do Koryu. Can you be my teacher? The initial answer is never yes. The initial answer has to be, let's go through a period of learning who each other is. Let's go through a period of working together. Will you do what I tell you to do? Will you do it the way I tell you to do it? And what are your barriers? Are your barriers things that you are not prepared to break down? Because if you're not prepared to break them down, we're not going to get anywhere. I, I can give an example of, of one of my students. He's now seventh down. But when I met him, he was fifth down and he'd had various teachers, but never had a fixed line. And I met him at a few seminars and he wanted to, to work with me. And so I worked with him for a few months and I realized that whatever I told him to do, he would do it exactly the way I told him to do it. He had overcome all the hurdles. He was a good fifth down. He had pushed aside most of the barriers and he had decided I want to do it your way, tell me what I have to do. And so we developed a good relationship. And after a while, he said, I'd like to take sixth down again, am I ready? And I said, no, you're not. I said, it's gonna take you about three years. You've got a lot of work to do still to get to that level. It was a bit of a shock to him, but he accepted it. And I then said, but try every year, just keep in the practice of doing the gradings, but don't be too disappointed. If you're not ready yet and it took him exactly three years three years later he passed sixth down and he's now seventh down so it shows that if the barriers are pushed aside you can make good progress but pushing those barriers aside it's very difficult you know i will still get students who are maybe fifth down come to me and say i heard yesterday that you said blah 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 i thought it was this well why would i be interested in what you thought it was you know, there's a barrier there that you haven't understood and there's a barrier you haven't broken down. There's that confirmation bias hasn't been broken down. So what you previously believed is stronger than what I'm telling you to do. And that can continue for years with some people. It, it can be very frustrating for both. But it's frustrating for them because they can't break it. It's frustrating for me because I can't help them to break it. All I can do is just keep pointing to it, but they can't be my direct student until they can break that down because they won't take what I tell them on faith. They will take what they already believe to be so, its priority. Yeah, this is 
really interesting because it, it sounds like I'm just going to try to sum up what you were saying earlier. Because there's that period where you're learning to overcome the hurdles, the, the teacher should take that period of time not only to teach them the physical techniques, but also as an opportunity to build the relationship. Absolutely. So the teacher oh, yeah. understands that the end goal is to get to the point where I can start working on these barriers to help the person become like a better person. But the only way to get there is to get through these hurdles first. Yeah. And it sounds like a great thing because uh, if, if the trust needs to be built, if the student needs to believe that the teacher can really help me, then you need to find a way to help them be more coordinated or learn new new actions that they couldn't do before and show them that you can do that, that as a teacher, you can help them achieve these things. That trust is then built. And then, then now you can work on the more deeper things. Sure. I mean, one can use a very banal analogy, but it's quite a, a relevant analogy. And that is if two people have a common interest and one of them recognizes that the other has a superior knowledge, it doesn't matter what the common interest is. One of them recognizes that the other has a superior knowledge and wants to learn from them, but they speak a different language. Then the person who wants to be the student has to learn the language of the teacher. And then they can start to communicate. It's not for the student to expect the teacher to learn the language of the student because the, lang the teacher will not be able to express themselves in a free and natural and open way in a new language that they've just learned they have to express themselves in their natural language. And the student has to develop their understanding of the language through the process of learning in order to get deeper and deeper into what it is the teacher is trying to teach. Now that can apply to science, it can apply to art, it can apply to martial arts, it applies to everything. If you don't have a common language through which you can express your thoughts, of course, you have the art itself, and in mathematics, you have the numbers on the paper, but you still have to understand and transmit the meaning behind those elements. Uh, and so it is with the Ido, the common language is the Seitei, as far as I'm concerned. That's the language in which you have the alphabet and the vocabulary and the grammar of the movements of swordsmanship. That's the language. So you learn the language, which we call Seitei. I can now take you in and express to you deeper things about the way I understand and perform and train and develop my Budo through Iaido. Mm -hmm. When they've approached that edge stage of overcoming the hurdles and you're starting to tackle barriers, is that something that is unique student to student to student? It's up to the teacher okay. kind of to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, there are, fair, there are a number of standard issues <laughs> if, if you want to call them that i mean there are a number of human characteristics that many people have so certain things are common but the combination of those things and the strength of them is different so take the confirmation bias for example it's a very common thing many people have confirmation bias to a certain extent but some people it is intrinsic to their nature and they just can't surpass it they just can't get past it and they are stuck because they cannot accept that something that is different to what they thought was the case is right. They will never progress. Whereas another person who has a bit of a confirmation bias and is thinking to themselves, oh, I thought it was that, but clearly it's not. Then they're going to get through it very quickly. I remember at a seminar recently, Eleanor's Jodo teacher, Ueda Sensei, she said, when you come to the dojo, come in as a beginner, and be prepared to throw away anything that you thought you knew. And that's very difficult for many people to do. But if you can't do that, you can't change. And the whole purpose of training and practice is to implement change. Because if you don't implement change, you can't make progress. It's, each, each is by definition the, the precursor of the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it's, because it's such a common thing that you hear, especially coming back from a seminar, a lot of students in a dojo would say, well, I heard this from this sensei. And yeah. it, it fits their own view of what should be right. So then... Yeah. And so they would rather take that than what you're teaching them. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just remember which dojo you're a member of and who is your teacher and what relationship you have with that teacher. And that's why a sensei-deshi relationship is a completely different relationship to 
a dojo leader, dojo member student relationship. So not all dojo members will be my direct students, they're just dojo members. But there are people outside my dojo who are my direct students, but they're not members of my dojo. They're two completely separate types of relationship. Of course, one hopes that one's dojo members will become your direct students because they will work with you enough and have faith in what you're teaching them and see their own development through what you're teaching them that they can put aside a lot of the barriers and start to move in the direction you want to show them. But it doesn't always happen. It's not always the case. Do you have an example of someone you thought would, get, would become a student but then didn't or someone that you didn't think would become a student but then surprised you and yeah it's, it's kind of a bit difficult to give examples of that because it could kind of cause offense really <laughs> yeah i mean i can give general examples where i've seen it more than once so nobody can say oh he's talking about me <laughs> yes okay. um, i often have students who will go to a do to a seminar and come back and say at the seminar they were teaching this 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 and this and it's different to what you're teaching but there were three seventh dance there teaching that thing Okay, those three seventh dans are all of the same uh, lineage and group and all under the same head teacher. Now, I'm not saying that head teacher is wrong, but I am saying that there can be other ways to do it. And so what do you want to do? Do you want to make a kind of hybrid of your EI, which is partly what I teach you and partly what somebody else teaches you? because I'm teaching you what I've learned from Harana Sensei and Oshita Sensei, and these teachers are teaching you what they've learned from somebody else. And I'm not saying that they're wrong. All I'm saying is if you mix it, there will come a point further down the line where these different methods come from a different understanding of EI, which you haven't got to yet. So you have to do it the way I'm showing you. Uh, yeah, but three seventh dance were all teaching the same thing you're not listening to me, okay? You're not listening to me. I don't mind if you want to do it their way, do it their way, that's fine. But that will always be a barrier between us mm -hmm. until you can break that down. And, and one day, yes, actually there has been an example of that. There has been an example of somebody who repeatedly came back from seminars, repeatedly wanted to do what was taught at the seminar rather than what I taught them. And then one day I was teaching something really quite basic and very simple. And it was how to use your fingers to control the initial movement of the Kasaki so that the Kasaki moves first. And we came across a diagram in a Zen Ken Ren publication. Can't remember what it was. And it was a Kendo publication. It was not about Iaido. And it was talking about uh, cutting. And it gave a series of three or four diagrams of how the sword moved. And the first movement was the Kasaki goes up before your hand moves forwards. And as soon as they saw that, they said, oh, what you're teaching us was right. Hmm. Well, what, what can I say? You know, there is an, a, a document from the Zen Ken Ren that is not the same as somebody else was teaching, but it's not the same point, you see. Sorry, I, I've, I've confused the issue here. The point through which they learned that what I was teaching them was correct was not the points that they had been arguing from seminars, the different points. But this diagram relating to what I'd been showing them suddenly made them realize that what I was teaching them was correct and therefore, all those other things where there had been a contention, which were not this point, they were other points. They suddenly realized, oh, we can do it the way you're teaching us because what you're teaching us is right. And then suddenly it all broke down and they stopped importing all of these other details which made their Eido into a, a hybrid form. And I must stress again, that what they were being taught was not wrong. It's another teacher's way of doing something which is different to my teacher's way of doing it. And it was causing a conflict and it was causing a, a conflict within the dojo as well, because these people wanted to do it a different way to the way I was teaching. Yeah, that, that's so interesting because it, it shows that this the student required some confirmation that what your, your she was learning from you 
was correct and that they can then trust you. And it seems like there's always going to be these moments that a student just realizes that, hey, I'll just listen to everything that they, they say. I've, yeah. I think I've been around barriers, long enough. Right yeah. Then the barriers start to break down and then the relationship starts to develop. Uh, but it, it can be a testing time and it can take a long time. For some people, they just don't get past it. But when they do, it's wonderful because once those barriers are thrown aside, uh, uh, they start to make progress very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, what's another standard issue barrier that you typically see in students? Well, apart from the confirmation bias, mm -hmm. people reading too much, reading too much, watching too many videos, getting too many alternative interpretations and alternative ways into their mind, which just confuses them. I, I think that the availability of information creates barriers. I think there is too much information available. And it's good to have information available, but it has to be ingested at the right time and at the right pace. And too much information, too many different attitudes, too many different ways of doing things seen too soon can just cause confusion. Can I give an example? I haven't prepared any examples. Yes, I can. Shibori. Shibori, which is the hand movement, which is like wringing water out of a towel. Uh, and basically, it's a movement of the thumbs towards the fingers rather than the fingers towards the thumb. And there's a lot written about this, and there's a lot talked on YouTube videos about this, and I haven't yet found one which I agree with. I'm not saying I haven't found one that's right. I'm saying I haven't found one that I agree with. So you get people who see this and, oh, it's like wringing water out of a towel. And so it must be tight. It must be hard, which is not going to work because you're going to tighten all of your fingers and you'll lose the uh, ken, uh, kensen, you'll lose the life of the kasaki. And your shoulders become stiff and the upper body becomes stiff. And we see this quite often from people that have read about shibori. Or they will not understand when shibori happens in the cutting action and they will do it right the way through the cutting action and so the grip becomes stiff and the wrists become stiff whereas in fact it's a description of a shape of a movement but it's got nothing to do with power or strength and the description of the shape of the movement doesn't tell you anything about timing and in fact it's something that happens very soft and very light at the end of the cut and I think what can happen is people who do kendo, who will apply shibori at the moment of impact, will use that action to strengthen the impact, to make it absolutely clear that the shinai hit the target. I'm generalizing here, and of course it doesn't apply to everybody, but I think it can happen. Whereas when you cut with a sword, it doesn't happen at the moment of impact. It, it happens at the moment before the sword stops moving, which in kendo is the same thing it hits the target and that's when it stops moving. So that's when you apply the shibori. But when you do it with a sword, it's not applied at the moment that the sword hits the target. It's applied at the moment the sword finishes moving. And this uh, confusion can cause a lot of problems. And this is a confusion that I have seen with people who've done a lot of kendo and then they want to try to do iaido. And it's a very difficult timing to adjust, very difficult to change. So that sounds like these alternative versions that people are hearing, it's not necessarily that they're teaching the act of shibori wrong, but they're leaving out some information, for example, yeah. where it should be ending, that yes. then confuses the students. Yeah, uh, and it may be that they don't know, and it may be that they're just passing on something they've read about and learned and haven't absorbed it in their own training. And it's not something that is easy to achieve. I mean, I first read about it probably 25 years ago. And I've only recently started to understand how it works. And it's not that I haven't been working on it. It's just that it's very difficult uh, to apply a subtlety of change of hand grip through the process of the sword cutting. You see, one, one of the hurdles I find is that a beginner student will lift their hands over their head and then you tell them what they have to do to cut. And then in their mind, in their memory, it's all a kind of black space and the sword's suddenly at the bottom of the cutting action. 
And so if you say what happened, they don't know. It started here, it finished here, and that's it. But as you train and you focus your mind more and more on the detail of how things are moving, you can change uh, the timing of how your fingers move in relation to the sword. And so you become more aware of the movement of the sword through the whole cutting process. And so you can then tune in, when does this happen? When does that happen in relation to the sword cut? But if you were to tell a beginner that you make this movement with your thumbs at the moment the sword is just about at, so he gets a height down to the end, there's no way in the world they're going to do it. And I think that we have to be careful what we teach and when we teach it in relation to the student's development. And that's what I mean by there's too much information available. It's too easily available and it can cause confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other side of that coin is that students can think that you are holding information back because they've been on YouTube and they've seen all of this information that I'm not sharing with them. And I'm not sharing it with them, not because I'm reluctant to give it to them is because they're not ready for it but with all of that knowledge easily available and with me feeding the information at the speed they need it and in time with their development it can to them look as though i'm, I'm withholding information I, I think that's that's a big problem that that's another barrier that's another barrier between the student and the the teacher and that's where the faith comes in you have to have faith in the fact that i'm telling you what you need to know when you need to know it because your progress is going to be hindered by trying to do too much too soon mm -hmm. i have a question there's a couple of concepts that we brought up earlier one of them was that a lot of people have things in their heads and they still haven't gone into their body yeah. Um, and that was an example you gave when you were learning Shibuti. You knew about it, but it took a while for you to get it. But then as a teacher, eventually you have to get that learning in the body back out to, into your head so you can express it to yeah. students. Maybe yeah. you can tell me about your progression. Choose one thing where you had to first learn it yourself in your body and then you had to figure out how do you extract it from that's, your body. That's back an interesting into question because I don't think, as you describe it, it's a problem because the process of assimilating the knowledge into the performance is a process of rationalizing. And so I think that if a teacher has struggled in their past with assimilating a certain action, overcoming a certain hurdle, then they are much more sympathetic to the students who are struggling with the same hurdles. And so it's a lot easier for the, the teacher to rationalize and help the student if they've had a struggle with the same hurdle themselves. I think that the teachers that find the most, oh, sorry, the seniors that find the most difficulty with teaching are the ones who had, let's say, a natural ability and not too many barriers and they absorbed it quite quickly. And their unspoken subconscious attitude is, why are you finding this difficult? because they don't understand why somebody can find it difficult. I think the teacher who became a teacher through a long process of struggling with these barriers probably is more able to communicate those things than somebody who hasn't had that struggle. Mm -hmm. The people that stick to martial arts or these type of things usually have a little bit of natural talent. So they come in and it's easy and then they feel, oh, I'm making progress. You do notice that, oh yeah, they picked up this subject a little quickly and they haven't really kind of internalized it in their head yet. How would you help them? Yeah, I think for those students, you have to wait until they hit th the barrier that relates to that. And the barrier that relates to that is, oh, this isn't as easy as I thought it was. So for example, first done no problem second done no problem third done yeah okay fourth done fail 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 there's a barrier there what's that barrier the barrier in this particular case is that it isn't as easy as they thought it was they got through the process of overcoming the early hurdles quite easily but now they're discouraged because they don't understand what it is that they're not learning and what it is that they're not learning isn't something that's written down in the book. What they're not learning now comes from a completely different source and requires a completely different way of assimilating understanding. This is not knowledge, this is understanding. And these 
are the first barriers that these people hit. And I think that's why a lot of people, they get to third done and then fourth done becomes a problem because during those years leading up to third done, if the teacher hasn't started to open the doors of understanding of what's required for fourth done, then fourth done is going to become a huge barrier. And I think the same happens at sixth done as well. You'll notice a lot of people, they either stick at fifth done or they give up at fifth done. Because if they haven't been given through their years, the early years of being a fifth done, what they need to open up to become sixth done, then they're going to hit another barrier of the same type. That barrier happens twice, fourth done and sixth done. Uh, there's, a, there's a change of perspective and a change of understanding of what Budo is at those two points. And the seeds have to be sown by the teacher prior to that. Otherwise, the, the barriers become psychologically insurmountable, not, not actually insurmountable. But if the student has any psychological weakness, they will give up very, very quickly. Uh, and that has to be prepared for. These barriers that you're saying at fourth and sixth end, these are not requirements of the rank that judges look for. These are things that you find are inherent in the student themselves that in order to reach their requirements, they need to overcome? Yeah, kind of. I mean, they are required from the rank. The, the, the Zen Kenren has issued um, a, a one page document which lists uh, what is examined at the different grading levels. And there is one list up to third done. There is one list for fourth and fifth done, and there is one list for sixth, seventh, and eighth done. So on that document, it does actually show you that there are new things that are required. And those new things, for example, for fourth done, you have to show Johaku. Okay. Well, you don't start learning Johaku six weeks before your fourth done grading. You have to start learning it through second and third done is not expected at first done because there's so many other physical problems that are required. Okay, know the words, understand what the words mean, but don't worry if it doesn't quite happen. Second done, third done, you need to start showing it at least in Nukitsuke. Even if you can't show it in Kaburi Kiriyoroshi or you can't show it in, in Chiburi, you can at least show that you've understood a little bit. So by the time you come to fourth done, where you should be showing it in most of your actions, you've had that, the seeds have been planted earlier. And so now they're starting to flourish. But if those seeds weren't planted and an understanding of Johaku was not explained and applied across the board through all actions or all relevant actions, of course, there are some actions where it doesn't apply, but all relevant actions, then it's not going to come out at fourth done. And you will get a fourth done applicant who is an extremely good third done, an extremely good third done, but he hasn't got that extra little thing that pushes it into fourth done. And it's not new knowledge. It's not new points. There are no new descriptions of the kata. There are new, no new things in the kata themselves that have to be learned. That's all done. But how you express the kata, how you express yourself through the movements of the kata goes to a new level when you start learning things like johaku. Uh, for, for sixth done, it's the first time that Kiken Taichi is examined. Now you don't start learning Kiken Taichi in your last year as a fifth dan, you start learning it in your first year as a shodan. But it's only expected to be fully absorbed and understood and part of the expression of how you create the kata from sixth dan and above. So the, the responsibility of the teacher to plant these seeds and, and help the student understand them and develop them through their progress towards that point helps them to avoid a barrier. But they need to have a close relationship with a teacher that can express that and explain that. And so students who are through no fault of their own, unfortunately, may be in a small dojo in a small town that isn't close to a high grade and they're doing the best they can with the knowledge they've got. And they go to national seminars, they pick up what they can and they take it back. They're not going to get that information because that information can't be taught in the context of seminars because it's personal between teacher and student and they don't have a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, as the student progresses, you can't start out with all the information because that will confuse them and overwhelm them. What does trickling this information, what does planting the seeds and then nurturing their growth look like? How does the seed grow over time? Ah, uh, right, I see. Yeah, and, and you took Johaku as an example. 
-hmm. Yeah. Well, for for a, an absolute beginner, it wouldn't even be mentioned. But once somebody's getting to around second queue, I would use the words Johaku and explain it in Nukitsuke. Because the book says, and, and here is, is the basic information, take the sword softly, take the sword slowly, gently. I can't remember the exact word, but it's you take the sword slowly. And then you have to accelerate into a cut. So how do you accelerate? How do you create this acceleration? This johaku feeling, this, this feeling of acceleration into the moment that the sword hits the target. And that sudden sharp movement with kime at the end of it. So in Nukitsuke, you can show how the hands start moving first, the body moves afterwards, the foot helps to deliver the sword, everything, each of these things add to the movement. So the acceleration progresses up to that point. And then they, by practicing slowly, can eliminate the hiccups that cause stops and starts. So for a beginner, coming up onto their knees is okay, but getting their feet up might cause them to sit back a little bit all of these little hurdles that we have to overcome, but gradually they get the understanding of how it works in Nukitsuke. And then they think they've got it, of course. <laughs> uh, and so you then have to show them how, when the book says, the sword mustn't stop overhead in Kaburi, you then have to show how that relates to Johaku being applied to Kaburi Kiriroshi or Kiritsuke, if, if, if that's what you prefer to call it. So you then show that, look, here's another action that has a Johaku in it. And, and then you can look at how, for example, drawing the sword into Kamai for uh, the ski in Ganmenate happens. And you can show that there's a Johaku in that movement. And then at a higher level, once they've got third done, maybe even once they've got fourth done, you can say as long as you hit this point, this kamai, the johaku can continue through into the ski. But you must hit all of the points along the way. But you can still do this with a feeling of johaku. And then ultimately, when people are working towards sixth done, you have to link that back to the breathing so that the the breathing gives the timing and the body moves in time with the breathing and then everything starts to come together and then that starts to develop towards kiken taichi as we were talking about before mm -hmm. well so this really links into something i've heard before about generally how humans learn is that first get a simple concept and then just think about it in different contexts so in this case let's not just perfect johaku for nukitsuke Let's just think about what does Johaku mean for Nikitsuke and then what does it mean for Kiri Otoshi? What does it mean for Ski? So you can get a grasp of the concept. And then as you, as you have a better understanding, now you add in breathing or how your body yeah. is moving to. Yeah. So ultimately, hopefully, it becomes a natural way of moving. It ceases to be something that you have to apply and it becomes something which is fundamental to how you move. So if you say to uh, a beginner, uh, show me Shomenuchi, they'll lift the sword overhead and stop, they'll step forward and they'll cut and their back foot might or it might not move. And if you say to a sixth dan, show me Shomenuchi, they will do it with and Kiken Taichi and everything will be smooth and comfortable and their feet will end up exactly the same distance as they started and their posture, she say, will not change. This is because they've absorbed Kiken Taichi and Johaku into their natural way of moving. Mm -hmm. So we covered a lot of things. Unfortunately, I have to get my daughter ready for school. Yeah. So could we potentially continue this conversation? Because I think there's still some open questions that we want to. OK, yeah. If you think through your questions and send them to me, and then I can think through them, and we can have another meeting, sure. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. OK. All right. Nice to meet you anyway. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Have yeah. a great day. Why not? Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode because we have a lot more exciting interviews and resources to help you explore the world of martial arts. To get the latest on what we're up to at Tokushikai Canada, subscribe to our newsletter at subscribe.tokushikai.ca and find us on Facebook and Instagram at tokushikai.canada. Until next time, thanks for listening.